the development of mRNA vaccines has led to the question, will mRNA vaccines be the breakthrough needed to develop an HIV vaccine? Additionally, what has prevented an HIV vaccine from being developed previously? It is important to first understand how a vaccine could block HIV infection. Spike proteins are proteins found on viruses that appear often as spikes protruding from the virus. Spike proteins are the proteins the viruses use to enter cells. The spike proteins found on HIV originate as one protein, GP160, but are modified into two proteins, GP120 and GP41. These proteins are expressed on the outside of the envelope surrounding HIV. It is the GP120 protein that binds with CD4 and the chemokine receptor CCR5 on human cells, allowing HIV to enter human cells. When binding of both the CD4 and the CCR5 receptors occurs, the GP41 is able to cross the host cell membrane and bind with internal host cell proteins. An effective HIV vaccine would stimulate the production of antibodies that could bind bind to the GP120 spike proteins on the HIV. Antibodies binding the GP120 protein would block the HIV from entering the cell. However, there is more than one challenge in producing such antibodies. First is the fact that HIV is an RNA virus. This directly affects how HIV is able to enter and infect cells. After entering a cell, the DNA from the virus integrates into the DNA of the cell. However, considering some viruses such as HIV are made of RNA, the question may arise, how can a virus made of RNA infect cells? The answer is that RNA viruses have an additional step that other viruses don't. The step of reverse transcription carried out by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase produces DNA copies of the RNA virus. Now that the genes from the RNA virus are in the form of DNA, the genes from the virus are able to infect the DNA of the host cell. However, the reverse transcriptase enzyme often does a poor job of copying the viral RNA. This results in DNA copies of the viral RNA that are mutations or changes from what the original RNA version of the virus coded for. If these mutations affect the genes for the spike proteins, such as GP120, it means the spike proteins will have a different shape than what the original spike proteins were shaped as. With each mutation comes the potential for a new shape to the spike protein. This results in a diverse array of the shapes of the spike proteins for HIV. Due to the different number of shapes of the spike proteins, any antibodies binding enough HIV to stop infection will have to be able to bind a broad array of different shapes of the spike proteins. This is why the type of antibodies needed are often referred to as broadly neutralizing antibodies, meaning antibodies that are broad in the types of spike proteins proteins they can bind. A main challenging to producing these antibodies is that many B cells that are capable of producing broadly neutralizing antibodies needed to block HIV are often antibodies that are too broad in what they are capable of binding to. These antibodies can also sometimes bind to healthy tissues. To protect the body from such antibodies, these B cells are either killed before entering circulation or are short-lived once they do enter circulation. This provides a very brief window of time for these B cells to be stimulated by a vaccine to produce antibodies. While a vaccine can provide antigen to stimulate B cells, a vaccine cannot ensure the proper type of B cell will be present to produce the needed antibodies. However, another approach has been examined after it was discovered some individuals infected with HIV have been able to produce enough antibodies to control the HIV infection within themselves. The virus continues to mutate as it spreads within infected individuals. The spike proteins take new shapes, meaning previously developed antibodies are ineffective at blocking the spread of HIV. However, some of these infected individuals produce new antibodies that match the new shape of the spike proteins on HIV. When the virus mutates again and the spike proteins once again change shape, these individuals are again capable of producing new antibodies that bind the new batch of spike proteins and stop the infection. This capability of producing new antibodies to bind new spike proteins with each mutation is a response to long-term HIV infection. An effective HIV vaccine would produce the same result of long-term HIV infection, meaning production of a wide array of antibodies
disease against HIV, yet without HIV infection taking place. This would require multiple injections of the vaccine spread out over months to introduce numerous antigens for the production of numerous differently shaped antibodies. Lastly, another challenge is the need to produce a cytotoxic T cell response. If any virus enters cells, T cells will be needed to kill cells infected with the virus. The challenge is developing an HIV vaccine that can stimulate both B cells to produce antibodies against HIV and to produce T cells to kill cells infected with HIV. This challenge, however, highlights how mRNA vaccines are at an advantage over other types of vaccination. One of the greatest benefits of mRNA vaccines is the ease of production. Often, a new mRNA vaccine can be produced in as little as four days. Other types of vaccines can often take months to develop. This can allow for much more rapid development of a vaccine that stimulates B cells and a booster shot of the vaccine to stimulate T cells. This would also address the challenge of needing several booster shots to produce a wide array of antibodies. Considering the large number of antigens that would need to be produced for the booster shots of the HIV vaccine, the ease of production could simplify generating the numerous antigens for the numerous injections needed. An additional benefit of mRNA vaccines is that mRNA vaccines last longer in circulation than other vaccine types. Protein vaccines can be entirely degraded within five days of injection. In contrast, some studies have shown that the antigen from mRNA vaccines can still be present up to five months after injection. While the B cells that produce broadly neutralizing antibodies are short-lived, the antigen from the mRNA vaccine is long-lasting. This can allow a greater amount of time for the antigen antigen to be available to stimulate short-lived B cells. Lastly, while the genes for the GP120 protein may mutate, the number of mutations is not endless. The mutations must be limited to a shape that still allows for the GP120 to infect cells. Thus, while there are numerous challenges to producing an effective HIV vaccine, mRNA vaccines may offer some hope. Thanks for watching, and remember to subscribe to our channel for the latest video on the science of human physiology.